Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. Well, it's like when I meet an English person here. In England, we probably have the worst connection because you have a rivalry of some kind, whether it's football or whatever it may be. You don't might not like that city. But when I meet an English person here, I feel connected to them. It's yeah. that psychological uh, barrier that's broken down, isn't it? And you feel connected. With everything you've just said in there, though, um, has there ever been a barrier? Because you're not in that community. Well, I mean, you are. I mean, personally, you, you've been brought into it. <laughs> Has there ever been that barrier between you guys as the coach and the players being deaf? Uh, well, the the community in general, in general, has been really accepting of me and and my wife, and um, you know, like we've both got sign names, which is a like a big thing. So yeah, cool. you have to be given your sign name by a deaf person. Can you do? Um, can you tell us what that is, or show us? Or... Yeah. So I'm, I'm Stretch. Stretch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just stretch. that's his nickname, everybody. Just so you know, yeah. Stretch. Um, and and my wife is like, um, uh, yeah, is is like Kim or Kim. Um, so that's cool. you know, she she only got her. You know, I've been involved in for ten years, and she only got her sign name when we went to world championships last year in Greece, and um, and the girls gave her a, a sign name. So, that's you awesome. know, she mate, she was so excited. She came running up to me. I've got a sign name. I've got a sign name, oh. and she showed me. And like it's it, it, to be around it for so long, you know that it actually means it really does mean something. Um. So yeah, that that was cool. Um, you know, the 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 community in general is very good. Um, there's some haters because I'm not deaf and I'm coaching the the national team, so I I do cop my fair fair amount of criticism, which is fine. You know, everyone's got their opinion, but um, I'm I'm also going to back what I do and and yeah. what I've provided and those things. So. You know, I'm 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 not a shrinking violet in that way. You want to have a crack, I'll, I'll I'm here for it. But, um, you know, it's just it is what it is. I also know that probably the day that I decide to move on is probably you know there'll be people that won't make me feel as welcome in the deaf community as well. But ultimately, I, I know what I've helped build, mm -hmm. and I know. I know how valuable it is and I hope at the end of the whole journey of me with the deaf team, um, anybody who's been a critic or anybody who's been a fan of what I do just appreciates what I've what I've helped build and, and the legacy that, that we've put together because the history of the deaf team is it's around for four, five six, seven, eight years, then it disappears for four, five, six, seven, eight years, and then it comes back. And yeah. and I sort of feel like we're at a real pivotal point at the moment where this could build it for the continued future. sustainability. Yeah. Well, coming from those humble beginnings, as you said last time in our pre-chat to the photos that I've shown and the community that seems to have been built, is a part of your journey and, and obviously everyone that's obviously contributing to being a part of that journey. So I'm sure they're loving what you're doing and they can, if they can self reflect and reflect of where it came from, then obviously they, 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 they must see the goodness that you and the team are doing right. And uh, for anyone that else is around the world is didn't know this existed. You, obviously you're playing against other countries, so they must have something in, in the home country of, of the other places. Let's say for example, somebody's watching from Sweden uh, and, and they connect to this somehow and they're interested there's, it's obviously out there, isn't it? Otherwise you'd have no one to play against. So it's, yeah. it's clearly there. Yeah, correct. So deaf international basketball federation, if you're a basketballer, mm -hmm. um, and the I uh, in ISCD International Sports Commission for the Deaf, so they they oversee the Deaf Olympics and things like that. But 
there are international, obviously there's Deaf Sports Australia if you're based here in Australia, mm-hmm. um, but then each country will have its its Deaf Sports organisations as well. But the DIBF um, for basketball, International Deaf Basketball, um, they are the world organisation. Mm. Um, they're, they're, you know, FIBA affiliated and all those things. Um, and the ISCD or ICSD um is the is the, is the international um, sports commission so brilliant well, covering any... all sports not just basketball so they yeah. they're all all sports. I was about to say if anyone is um, watching this and everything's transcribed and there is a uh, subtitles on YouTube as well and a transcription on um, the others. If anyone is watching it or reading it, um, please, and you're interested in a sport that of yours, Google this if you didn't know it existed. Brett. Uh, stretch i want to call you stretch i want to get in the habit because all i hear is stretch and I, I, i'm just not in that habit <laughs> Brent, um, but go out there google everything there and we can put them in the show notes as well if anyone is yeah. interested um but going on going back to you then um let, let's go back to your beginning of your basketball journey um you said you were five years old yeah, yeah. um so there was a bit of a rule in our house that when you turned five you um, <laughs> had to start what pick a sport <laughs> nice. so we were a pretty active family um my brother i've got a, a brother who's three years older um he actually turned 50 this week and it's really weird having a 50 year old brother it makes you feel quite old yeah. um yeah so he he played footy um you know aussie rules football uh he played footy and um hockey he skateboarded he did you know he sort of did a bit of everything but um, he was a very good hockey player, um, and he turned into a very good basketball player later on, but he started playing after I started playing. Um, my mum was a librarian, so oh. mum's solution to pretty much everything when you had to search for information was, let's go to the library. So I, I spent a lot of time in a library when I was a kid. I am a horrible reader. I don't read books. I love listening to audio books, but I, I don't read. But I can't my mum, sell you my book then. Hey, I can't sell you my book then. <laughs> get it on audio. I'll listen yeah. to it. We're not um, there yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I grew. I spent so much time as it. You know, I'd go to work with mum and spend days, whole days in the libraries and things like that. So, um, and that was well before the interweb and you know real computers and things like that. So, you know, you libraries I kind of kind of feel pretty comfortable in. But um, so, you know, mum said, what sport do you want to play? You know, I dabbled in football and cricket, um, but it didn't feel like I liked it, but I didn't love it. Like, yeah. um, and when she finally said, you know, time to pick a sport, what do you want to do? My well, I don't know. Like, I like cricket, but you kind of either a batter or a bowler. Like, you never, you're not fully in the action. Football, the same thing. If your team's bad and you're playing in the back line, you might not even touch the ball. And, and I just, I just wasn't sure. So, Mum, come on, let's go to the library. And I vividly remember going to Croydon Library. And she took me into the, you know, the sports section. She goes, pick a sport. And I'm looking through and there was something about this basketball book. I can still see the cover of the book. There was something about the basketball book and I'm like, I want to do that. Mm. Um, And back then, you know, again, no internet, Mm. (laughs) no computers. Just Brent, how, how old are you? Tell everybody how old you are. First. I'm, I'm 46. I'm 47 yeah. in October. So, yeah. you know, this is like, what, 1983? The year I was born. 82 or 83? Mm-hmm. Like, so then none of my family have ever had anything to do with basketball and poor mum's got to find me a basketball team. <laughs> I was going to ask, what? actually, if you were a basketball family, uh, or if you, yeah. you know, at that point. Yeah. No, I was I was the first one. So poor mum, off she goes on her research mission. <laughs> I don't I don't even know how she did it. I should ask her one day. Um, yeah. Um, 
Anyway, she found Maroondah Magic Basketball Club and I turned up to my first training session as a five-year-old playing under 10s. Wow. Were you and tall we both, at five? Were you stand out? Yeah, I was I was always tall. I was always the tallest kid in my grade. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and um, probably around grade six, year seven, I grew 11 inches in two years. Wow. So, um, you know, by the time I started year seven, I looked like a year nine or a year 10. Was your dad tall? Six one. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's... Pretty tall, I suppose. Reasonably, mum's, mum's like five seven, five eight. Um, She's quite tall for a, a lady, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, my brother's six two. He's only little. Um, only little six two. God, yeah. you make me feel small. Um, yeah, so you know, turn up. I remember. I also remember looking at the scoreboard at the end of my first basketball game, domestic. It was caught for at Kilsyth, and we lost one hundred and twenty two to two. And oh, I thought wow. it was the fucking greatest thing I'd ever done in my life. I, I, um, I've never missed a, a game of my son's. My son is following my footsteps. You know, I, I think I did pretty well for a small dude and coached. You know, I was the first under 18 head coach to take two teams, well, twice as an assistant to the Final Fours in the UK and one as a head coach. So I did no. pretty well as a coach, young, and then I went back to playing because I thought, I'm only 18, why am I, why am I doing this? I, I want to yeah. go back to playing. So I went back to playing a little bit. And actually the the guest that just went on a few weeks ago who ended up going to Davidson, he was a teammate of mine. He was part of the underrated Steph Curry journey. So if you missed that one, definitely go back and watch that episode. Yeah, right. um, so he admits I'm part of that Davidson journey. You know, when you tell you that to people, you think you're yeah, bullshit. But I've got evidence now, so all good. I can say it. <laughs> but um, so I went back to play and that's how I, I know Lovedale. Um, yeah. And then I ended up coming out here and, and, and coaching out here. That That's a little bit about my journey, but I've never missed. I obviously didn't make it to basketball in the sense of getting paid a good amount of money and surviving yeah. off it. There's just no way. Small dude back then w- was a problem. Not maybe as so much a problem anymore, but back then it was. Yeah. Um, your, you and your journey, mentality of my dad, was your dad, so me being the dad to, to Drew, I don't want to ever miss a game of his. Yeah. What, um, and hoping he can go further than I ever did. Um, it's just about instilling the passion, isn't it? W- where did your passion come from um, out after you found that book then? Was was your mum and dad in, in, involved in your basketball journey as much as yeah. I am? They they both were in very different ways. Like mum mum team managed a bit different teams. Yeah. Um, she also ended up on the committee for Marina Magic Basketball Club, and she's um, she's a life member of the club. So yeah. mum mum put in a long time um, uh, as as part of the the club. Even after I left the club, so when I got to I think it was under sixteens. Um, they didn't have enough players for an A-grade team, like a, a first team. So it got to a point that, um, you know, I was I was playing pretty kind of elite-level basketball for an under-16 at that stage. Um, so it, it kind of my, – my choices were taken away from me. I, I had to leave the club, and I'd, I'd sort of played there. That was my domestic club. I also played for Kilsoth Cobras, who were, you know, representative um, – club of of the entire association so Mm -hmm. um but i I just had to change domestic clubs but even then mum stayed on the committee um and and got a life membership um which is really cool um very cool sorry why did you have to leave oh they didn't have enough players for an a grade team so i was going to end up playing b grade or a reserve and i'm like no i kind of need to be playing against the I need to wanted to be playing against yeah. the best players in the in in the in the comp. So um, yeah. so yeah, I left and and went and played for another club. But yeah, like I said, Mum stayed on and stayed on the committee and got her life membership and all of those things. I think my brother was still playing for the club at at that point. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, and then Dad, Dad wasn't heavily involved he'd he'd go to games he mate my parents were awesome but you know like parents coaching rep ball driving their kids all over victoria on friday nights and then sunday mornings to to train like mate my mum and dad like they supported me in everything i wanted to do like honestly couldn't have asked for for more supportive parents in that sense 
Um, they, Dad, when I got to under 18 in rep ball, there was three Kilsoft Cobras teams and I, I got put in the third one and I was really disappointed. Um, I thought I should have made the second team for whatever reason, I got put in the third team and there was no coach and it looked like the, the team was actually going to fall apart. Like if they couldn't get a coach, the club were going to pull the team. Mm. So my dad put his hand up and said, I'll coach just so that I could genuinely keep playing basketball. And um, at a real pivotal time, you know, like I was 16, um, probably 15 at that stage, um, about to turn 16, pivotal stage, of, you know, a, a teenage boy. Basketball was still my only love. Um, and and Dad stepped in as a non-basketball person. Good on him. And to my dad's credit, he studied every book. He read every coaching manual he could find. Like, he was not... Absolutely not a traditional basketball coach, but he did everything he could to to be to to turn himself into a basketball coach. Um, wow. So yeah, and we 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 made finals that year. We had a great team. Chemistry in the team was awesome. I think everybody, parents and players, all appreciated my dad for actually stepping up and. And doing the job when the team was actually going to fall apart. So, um, yeah. you know, the the chemistry. Like it, I look back, and it's it's um, that team has got really really fond memories of um, of of junior basketball for me. Like yeah. um, they weren't the best players I played with. It wasn't the best coach I ever had, but it was it was you know a really pivotal. Pivotal moment. If there's no bar, if there's no team, what am I doing? You know, I see it as a a, a crossroad. Yeah. If there's no team there, where do I end up? Am I just, you know, hanging around down the station with? Totally. You know? Yeah. Well, and before we leave, before we go on to the part uh, of of your transition from that club to you know to the the adult level, the pro level of basketball. What was your childhood like at home? Where did you grow up and and things like that? I uh, grew up in the outer eastern suburbs of Melbourne, mm -hmm. um, so around Croydon, um, played for Kilsyth, so all all kind of, for, it's it's not outer, outer, outer east now, but it was the yep. outer east, you know, foothills of Dandenong Ranges and things like that. Um, yep. um, you know, working class family, um, dad was an electrician and went back and um went to night school and became an electrical draftsman, electrical engineer sort of situation. Um, mum was, mum just worked office jobs, um, really like a, an admin person. She worked, she was an admin for um, a law firm in Croydon. Um, she was admin for a, um, a mechanic um, in Doncaster. Like mum just kind of worked admin jobs and then mum went back and studied um, to become a librarian and and sort of follow her passion of, of books and literature mm. and things like that. So, um, you know, she always just wanted to be around around that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, just working class family, older brother, we hated each other, fought like cats and dogs. He was really mature for a, um, for a kid, and I was really immature. Um, so he that gap was, was even bigger. <laughs> yeah, it was three years and it was probably about 10 years by maturity. Um, yeah. yeah, he was um, pretty aggressive and had a short fuse and I was a, I was, I was a smart ass. So, Nothing's changed. Uh, no, nah, it was a pretty bad combination. Um, <laughs> Copped a few hidings. We, we genuinely, I, I, I'm pretty confident to say we genuinely hated each other. Yeah. Um, it sounded like your your mum and dad kind of, I suppose, had motivation, had drive. Is that where you – do you have the same traits as your, as your mum and dad then in that sense? Because obviously you've led your own way some shape or form in your own way. Is is that where it's embedded from, do you think? It's a really interesting question, mate, and it's something that I've – you know, knowing that this conversation's 
been coming up. I've obviously been, you know, driving around. I spent a lot of time in the car, um, yeah. you know, driving around thinking about a lot of these things. And For sure. Um, you know, it's something that just by thinking about it, I'm actually really proud of my parents that they, um, you know, they – they had the guts with a young family to actually go and study and put in the work yeah. to um to to change to change their their careers and do those things like uh, you know I, I sort of go through it now n- not go through it but mm. i see people going through those decisions when they're coming to study with the college so yeah. all of our students are, are career changers and um it's true yeah ma- ma- mature age students so um you know it's a a massive decision and i look back on it like mate we we weren't wealthy like you know dad essentially for a lot of our lives was a tradesman an electrician so you know some weeks yep he did a you know might do a big job and get a get a good pay and then for weeks he might be working on the next one before he gets gets that pay so you know cash flow was up and down i yeah. had no idea about it i'm money I'm now looking back from the experiences that i've got now as an adult yeah thinking like fuck man like they 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 tried real hard like they they it sounds like it for sure um, yeah. it really tried dad um dad dad did have some issues with I, and i'm i didn't really you know like i you're a kid. You you sort of probably don't understand full effect, but yeah, it's a later on in life. I, yeah. I now look back on it and think um, my dad had some mental health issues, like and and pretty serious, like you know depression and things like that. Um, because of how much he, work he was putting in, maybe do you think? Or? I don't know. He he um, where he ended up, he was he was a contractor. He he got retrenched or made redundant from a company that he worked at for a really long time and it, it really it destroyed him like he was absolutely heartbroken like i remember as a really young kid going to the christmas parties for this company in Lilydale. like you know it was like family and then they they got rid of him hmm. and it was um i think it really rattled his cage and, and really kind of um kind of upset him and maybe never got over it i don't know um obviously i'm not a psychologist or yeah. um but he, but there would be you know he'd go on to another contract a six month contract a three month contract and and they'd get to the end of the contract and if it didn't get renewed like it was almost a repeat of that 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 process and and he'd become depressed and um you know he could he could spend Days, weeks, months in bed, or like just wouldn't get out of bed. Wow. Like, um, and then you know the whole house suffered. Like we didn't have that income. Mum was running a little wool and haberdashery shop, and you know as much as it was a a, a great little shop, it it you know it wasn't it wasn't making squillions of dollars. Um, yeah. But you know it was it was paying its way, and Mum ended up selling that, and like. So you know, just like like little, just little things, um, you know, made it hard. And as a kid, you don't fully realise what's what's going on. But Dad was obviously, you know, having his own battles. And do you know what those and, battles might be from now? No, honestly, like, honest truth, mate. We we um, mum and dad split up when I was nineteen. Um, and was that uh, because of the way your dad was? Do you think? In, in the... Well, I'm sure it had some things to do with it. Dad, Dad's a you know unique character in a lot of ways, um, um, and you know it's it, it's probably why I think I have such a you know real love and appreciation of um, you know that time with that basketball team yeah. because you know it was the time that Dad and I actually connected. He connected well with my brother, but. Dad and I just didn't necessarily. You know, we weren't into the same things, mate. Like, um, it sounded like he tried with the basketball, though. Really tried, mate. Really tried, and I'd, 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 I'd be lying if if I said anything otherwise. He, um, he really did try, and it was a like a, you know, I'd be every day he'd get home and I'd be out playing basketball on the driveway. Like literally, it was. Did he join like, you? 
yeah, he'd he'd actually come out and he'd throw the ball back to me, and oh. we like, and it was that was our that was our time, that was our thing. I don't know whether he loved it, hated it, but he did it, and that's what I appreciated. You know, like, um, we we'd chat, we we'd talk. Sometimes we wouldn't talk, just play basketball, shoot foul shots. He could fucking make foul shot after foul shot. It was, and it was a horrible action. But he just, <laughs> again, textbook. Like if you drew a basketball shot in a textbook, that's how my dad shot it, and they just went in. Brilliant. Like, <laughs> so you know, we we'd play little foul shooting games, and you couldn't push him a metre off the foul line. He couldn't hit a cow's ass with a banjo, but from the foul line, mate, he was dead on. And um, it just, you know, just fun things. So then we, we'd have foul shooting competitions and, you know, me going, I'm going to be a pro and my fucking dad who doesn't play basketball at all beat me. <laughs> like, just just fun, you know, like fun. And yeah. um, and it was enjoyable. Um, but mum and dad, mum and dad split up. When I was nineteen, um, and it our relationship that was the best our relationship ever was those driveway basketball moments and that team. So and that's, and that's beautiful. So when when but unfortunately when somebody splits up like that, what did your relationship look like with? I'm assuming you stayed with your mum. Stayed with mum. Mum yeah. and I are super close, mate. She's actually she's um, she sold her house. She's living with us at the moment. Oh so, no way. Um, yeah, it's, Hi, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> so, which, which direction did your relationship you go for, for with your father after 19 years old then? Uh, mate, we both tried to, really tried to keep the relationship, but it's never, it's never worked, mate. It's just, we're different people and... And that's um, sad, but as long as, as long as you know you both tried, that's what matters, right? Yeah, I, uh, you know... I, I don't know. I don't know if he knows whether he tried or not. He's um, he remarried. He Sorry. Do you think he tried? Uh, at times. At times. Yeah. So there's no relationship there now. No, I haven't spoken to him in about two and a half, three years. Yeah. Two, twofold. Do you want to have a relationship, or do you? And or and do you think there could be a relationship? Um. Oh, mate. Oh, honest truth. Now. Like it is what it is. I'm yeah. just, I've got, I've got my support network that I have around me that I love and trust, and I know they love and trust me. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've I've built that network without him. Yeah. Um. So you have that closure. Yeah, I've I've got I've got. People like I said before, Martin Semkin, that's a friend, a mentor, father figure, like, yep. you know, the honest. <laughs> what are the odds, man? My phone is ringing and it's Martin Semkin. No way. Dead set. Well, you'll have to tell him later to listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll get you know, him on. I've, I've, I've had those, I've had those other people in my life um, that, that have filled that role. Like, yeah. and it's, have I wanted that father figure? Well, fucking oath, man. I, I, I'd, I'd love to have that relationship, but it's just. Just not that. Man, my, my, my dad's not that dude. Like, so, yeah. so I look elsewhere. The, the best, the, the, the best thing that happened Sorry, I'm not frozen. No. The, the best thing that happened out of that split up was my relationship with my brother. What happened with your brother? How did it? How did that better? How did that develop? Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.